What the heck are scriptable objects anyway? In this video, we're gonna take a look at what they are, how they work, and some real life use cases that I've personally used in my own games. Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy, here to help you, yes, you, make your game dev dreams become a reality. We're gonna jump right into it today. What are scriptable objects and what is the problem that they're trying to solve? A scriptable object, the best way to think about it is a data container with some extra functionality. We can store things like primitive types, class instances, prefab references, basically any type of data that we need for our game. If we take a look at the Unity documentation, the number one thing that they say that you would use a scriptable object for is housing data to reduce your memory footprint of your game. And while this is a really good use case for it, there are more use cases, but let's focus on that one first. The critical thing is that we're trying to house non-changing data because whenever we use a scriptable object, it's effectively like a static class. There's a few subtle differences between a static class and a scriptable object, one of which is the scriptable object we have an instance of, and remember static classes we cannot create instances of, but whenever we're referencing that one scriptable object, we're reusing that across probably multiple different components or game objects, different scripts, and as a result, if we change the one value on the one scriptable object, that's gonna impact every object that references that scriptable object. So I'm saying it's kind of like it's static because we have a lot of stuff referencing that one static instance. Since we need to create an instance for that scriptable object, how do we do that? Creating scriptable objects isn't immediately clear how do you do that because whenever you create a C-sharp script, it gives you a mono behavior. We're gonna follow that same process to create a scriptable object because we need to define the instance type of that scriptable object that we wanna use before we use it. So remember, we want to create it like we have a prefab, we wanna create an asset scriptable object that we're gonna use in our project. We're generally not gonna create new ones at runtime that we're gonna store and try to reference later. That's something that we generally don't do. So let's walk through a real use case of how do we create a scriptable object. First, we're gonna right click in the project panel, create C sharp script and call it whatever we want. In this case, I'm gonna use enemy. And then whenever I'm making a scriptable object, I always suffix it with scriptable object. And I do that just because I'm probably also gonna have an enemy C sharp mono behavior class. And if I have an enemy scriptable object, I can't name them both enemy without making them in different namespaces. It just gets really confusing. So I always just label it enemy scriptable object or whatever scriptable object, if it's gonna be a scriptable object. Once we've created that C-sharp script, let's open that up in Visual Studio. And a really common mistake whenever people are just getting into using scriptable objects is they forget to change this last piece of mono behavior to scriptable object. So we're gonna extend the scriptable object class instead of the mono behavior class. If we don't do this, the next step is not gonna work correctly. Step two is we need to add create asset menu attribute to our script. And that's on the script level, so at the top level right above the class. The create asset menu attribute accepts three parameters. The first one is the file name, and that's the default file name that we wanna provide whenever we're creating create that scriptable object. I usually just use the class name, so in this case I just use enemy, not the scriptable object piece, just enemy. Number two is the menu name. This tells the Unity editor where to place this creation item. Scriptable objects are always under the asset create menu. And then from there, wherever we define in this menu name is where it's gonna go. So if we provide something like enemies forward slash enemy, then we're gonna get a new menu that says enemies with an enemy element underneath it. That way we can group common things together. Like maybe we'll have enemy attack configuration, some other enemy configuration type, and we can put those all together underneath the enemies submenu. If we just provide enemy, then it's going to show up in that big list of asset create. And that ends up getting kind of annoying if you have like hundreds of items there. That's why we can create these sub menus to make it a little bit more clean and consistent. The third one is the order. It specifies where on this asset menu should it show up. The lower numbers are going to show up higher on the menu. The higher numbers are going to show up lower. And if you leave a gap of more than 10, you'll get a line in between them. So that way you can kind of logically separate, okay, these things are grouped together, these things are grouped together, and these things are grouped together. Just leave a gap of more than 10 and you can do that. If you leave them at just straight numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, then you'll get all those in that order that you specified with no separator between them. Now that we've talked about how do we create a scriptable object, let's look at what kind of data do we put into a scriptable object. Whenever we're doing that, we need to remember that whatever we put in here will be bundled into our build. We will only retain changes through runs that are made via the Unity editor, including in play mode, and it will be effectively static for anything that references 
this particular instance. So whenever we're trying to think about what kind of data do we want to put into a scriptable object, think about is this data that's not going to change or that if it does change, it should apply to all of my enemies. Let's use this exact use case here. So something like move speed, maybe that makes sense to put it onto the scriptable object because I want all my enemies of this type to move at the same speed. I could put in base health because I want all of my enemies to start with this amount of health, but I'll need to track the health of each individual enemy on the enemy script, because if I subtract from this, then it's going to affect every single enemy, not just that particular one that got hit. We could also put things like the height of the enemy and let's put something to an attack configuration. So I'll make a second scriptable object here just to make it kind of make a little bit more sense and show the power that we can have reusable configurations that are applied to multiple different scriptable objects. So let's let's take this example because I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. If we're going to take an attack configuration, I'll define that maybe I have two kinds of enemies that I want to attack the same kind of way. Like they're going to they're going to do the same thing. They're not really meaningfully differentiated from one another. What I can do in that case is create one single attack configuration and put in things like the attack delay, the attack damage, attack range, this kind of configuration and only create one of those. So that way, if I want to change the behavior of how does this group of enemies attack, I just change that one scriptable object base enemy attack configuration. If I change that one, then anybody who's using that will also be affected. So that's a really cool way that I can reduce the amount of changes I have to make to update how my enemies are behaving. This makes it very easy to test different configurations and determine does it actually make sense for these two to share a configuration if I don't like how one of them is configured, what I can do is simply create a new scriptable object, adjust the values and link it to the previous enemy that I want to now attack a different way. This is why a lot of the time I'll say that using scriptable objects is making a configuration driven game instead of more like a hard coded one where you're maybe setting values directly on a static class or just on the script itself or through prefabs where that kind of stuff can get lost very easily or it becomes really cumbersome to manage that kind of configuration. This way we've grouped all of our configuration for that enemy in one place, all the configurations for an attack configuration in one place. We can structure them where we have them all in the same folder or maybe if we have too many configurations, we can start having a folder structure to make sure that it's organized and easy for us to maintain because even in my game that only has like four different base enemy types and then some different boss configurations. Then I have new configurations for spawns that some of the bosses can do and just ended up creating a lot of different scriptable objects. So I needed to create some folder structure to keep it organized because it quickly grows out of control whenever you have many different types of things that need to be managed through a configuration. To close the loop on the basics here, everything that we defined in the scriptable object, we do not need to define on the base class mono behavior that we're gonna use. So like the enemy doesn't need to have a move speed or a height or anything like that. It just needs to reference the scriptable object, enemy scriptable object that defines the configuration for that enemy type. Now we've reduced, let's say we have a hundred enemies, instead of having 200 extra floats, we only have two floats because we don't need to copy those values on every enemy. And most likely your enemies have more than just two things. There's probably a lot of configuration that goes into them. This ends up really reducing the memory footprint of your game, which is what Unity was saying in the documentation is one of the big advantages of using a scriptable object. So how do we add that scriptable object reference to a live mono behavior? We'll make a new C-sharp class called enemy. That means it's going to be attached to a game object and we will have a discrete instance of this enemy running around somewhere in our game. What I'll do is add a enemy scriptable object configuration in a private in health. Our enemy probably has more configuration than this, but we'll just start with this to showcase what we're talking about today. Since each enemy needs their own health, remember that this is really important. We keep the health on the enemy itself and we do not modify the scriptable object health because that's going to override it for every enemy. On start, what we'll do is assign the health to be the base health from the enemy scriptable object. That way, at the very start after this object is created, we'll make sure that we start out with the correct base health and our enemy will be able to have that life subtracted from them without it impacting the configuration that we set up on the scriptable object. Now all we need to do is create a prefab for our enemy with the model and whatever other behaviors it needs, attach that enemy script and drag in the inspector for that prefab the enemy scriptable object for that particular instance to that enemy scriptable object configuration that we added the enemy script. Based on how the, we set this up, you can create those enemy scriptable objects by going to asset, create enemies, enemy. That will create a new scriptable object called enemy. We can rename it 
whatever we want it to be, set up the values, and then attach it to each game object prefab that we've created for the enemy. The same goes for the attack configuration. We can go to assets, create enemies, attack configuration, get a new attack configuration, hook that up to whichever enemy instances we want it to be associated with. And that's it really. But Chris, I have components in my game that cannot read the scriptable object value and they have their own settings for each component. Like the nav mesh agent can't read your base enemy speed. Can I still use the scriptable object approach? Of course you can. You don't have to do it this way. This is just reducing the memory footprint for components that you control for out of the box components or maybe components that you got from some asset maybe don't work very well with the scriptable object approach. So you will lose out on that memory benefit on whatever components can't read those same values, but you can still define all of this in a scriptable object so that way all of your configurations stay in one place. Let's use the NavMesh agent as an example. You know, I spend a lot of time working with the Unity NavMesh system, so we can't modify the NavMesh agent to pull all of this configuration from the scriptable object. Instead, what we can do, and what I personally do, is apply the configuration from that scriptable object to the NavMesh agent and to whatever other components need to be set up on start, just like we did the help. I generally like this approach because then I can define all of that configuration in one place. I don't need to bounce between prefabs. I don't need to worry about is this set from the configuration from the scriptable object or is it set up on the prefab? Like there's too many variables to worry about and where they come from. So I like to just put it all in the scriptable object, say this is how it's defined and have that scriptable object know how to set up that enemy. And that's where it gets really cool because the scriptable object is not just a data container, it's also a C-sharp class. So we can put logic into the scriptable object to manage whatever we need it to do. So all I'll do is create a public void, set up navmesh agent that accepts a navmesh agent agent. And what we're gonna do there is apply the move speed and the height parameters from the navmesh agent configuration. We can call this from the enemy start function, passing in get component navmesh agent, or if for some reason on awake, we have already grabbed a reference to that agent, we can just pass in that cached reference. Now, before you go get up in arms about how this is bad design because we now made the scriptable object and the enemy coupled with having a navmesh agent, I know that's what we did. I get it. Why I think this is not a huge deal is you have at the beginning of your game most likely already chosen. We're going to use this system or that system, whatever, for how the enemy's going to move. It means the likelihood of you having an enemy without a nav mesh agent is very small. If you're making a library where you want to work on many different things, then maybe you would consider making this more decoupled. I personally like this solution because what we've done is couple them through the scriptable object. So if we want to change anything with this coupling, we only have one place to make those changes. What I personally like to do is set this up with a single function call, set up enemy, passing in the enemy that we're gonna set up and have the scriptable object find whatever references it needs and set up all of those configurations because that configuration is responsible for assigning all of these values because it knows about what those values are and how they should be applied. So yes, it's true. I have coupled the nav mesh agent and whatever other configurations need to be applied together with the enemy. So I can't have an enemy necessarily without the nav mesh agent. Depending on how you set this up though, you can not have that coupling there because a lot of times I'll just check, did we have a nav mesh agent applied? If not, then we just want to apply those configurations and move on with our day. That way our scriptable object knows how to configure stuff. And if something's not set up, we can log a warning maybe, or just skip it all together. If we know that that's a possibility that maybe this particular type of enemy doesn't have that kind of component. So it's okay if that's missing. A possible alternative to this, if you really don't like that coupling, is have whatever you have spawning your enemies, have that set up all of these values based on the scriptable object and the configuration because whatever spawning the enemies also probably needs to know about how those game objects are configured. I personally did it that way before and that class grew quite large. So then the alternative was to move that to a different class and when I was moving into a different class, I felt like the configuration was the best class to put that in. The last thing I want to talk about here is something that we talked about in AI series part 19, round spawning and scaling up enemies. If you want to take a second to imagine a game you have like Llama Survival, where you are spawning enemies over time and after you complete a wave or a round, we will buff up the enemies. In this case, what you're defining on the scriptable objects will be the base configuration for your enemies because you don't wanna modify those at runtime. If you do modify these at runtime in the Unity editor, 
these values will scale up. This becomes a problem because most of the time when you're testing your game, you're running it in the Unity editor. So your base values keep getting overwritten as you scale up your enemies. And your game ends up becoming extremely hard when you put it onto the device because now your enemies have been scaled up so many times that level one is impossible to play. This is not a problem when you're actually running the game on the device though. Making these changes and scaling up on the device will not override the base values. This is a really important distinction that when you modify the base scriptable object in the Unity editor, regardless if it's play mode or in edit mode, that will update the scriptable object. The same behavior does not apply to a built game. So something I always recommend, if you're going to mutate the data of your scriptable objects at runtime and you want them to be reset to the base configuration at some time, you need to do one of two things. One is you can do, as I did in AI series part 19, create copies of your base scriptable objects and then scale up the copy because that's just in-memory data then. If we then remove all references to that particular scriptable object copy, then it will be cleaned up by the garbage collector later on. That way we retain our base configurations and we can still have that scale up effect of more powerful, more engaging enemies. The alternative is to have some kind of reset functionality on the base scriptable object that you're going to use and make it restore the default values. This way you effectively are doing the same thing just in reverse. So the only solutions I have for you is to copy the data and then either use the copy data or restore the base data from the copy. There is a downside to this though, because whenever you want to create a copy of your scriptable object, the fastest way to do that is with reflection. That's the least amount of code for you to write, but reflection is also relatively slow. Depending on your game, maybe that way is fine. Maybe there's not a big performance issue there. For me, I was creating new agents at runtime and they're following me around. So I need to quickly be able to create this up. So what I did was in the copy function, just manually write this value equals instance value this value equals instance value, this value, value equals instance value for every single value on the scriptable object. Also on any subscriptable objects, I had to do the same thing, pass in the new configuration and ask like the attack configuration to scale itself up. And honestly, the code isn't very fun to write, but it is the fastest way that I know about at least at runtime to achieve that copy. To quickly recap just everything we've talked about so far, number one, Scriptable objects allow you to create configuration driven games that can both reduce the memory footprint and increase your productivity by reducing the amount of configurations you have to set up because you can reuse configurations across different objects where it makes sense. It does take time to get used to writing code this way. I know it does take a little bit of time, but it does provide you some pretty cool benefits that I do think is worth taking some time to get accustomed to writing code that way. Number two, if you're gonna modify the values of the scriptable object at runtime, do not modify your base scriptable objects unless you want them to persist across runs. If you don't want them to persist across runs, make sure that you're making copies of your scriptable objects and use those whenever you're mutating the data. Number three, scriptable object instances are effectively static. So if you're modifying values, you will modify all the values for everybody that's referencing that scriptable object. So make sure you're thinking about what data you put in there should it be something that affects everybody or should it be something that only affects one game object or one instance of a script? I want to give a huge shout out to all of my Patreon supporters. Every one of you is helping this channel grow, reach more people and add value to more people. And that means more people are making their game development dreams become a reality. If you want to support this channel, you can go to patreon.com slash LAM Academy, choose which tier is right for you, get a voice shout out starting at the awesome tier and some other cool perks at the tremendous and phenomenal tier level. Speaking of those awesome tier supporters, I have Andrew Bowen, Gerald Anderson, Autumn K, Matt Parkin, and Paul Barry. Thank you all for your support. I am so grateful. And hey, real fast guys, I know normally at the end I'm asking you to like and subscribe and I I definitely appreciate it when you do that. But one thing I want to ask that I don't normally ask you to do is share this video. If you got value out of this video, share this video with somebody or some group that you think would also get value out of this video. I'd really appreciate that. That really helps the channel grow, reach more people, and I valued more people. And you know that that makes more people make their game dev dreams become a reality. Remember, new videos posted every tutorial Tuesday, and I'll see you next week. Oh, I forgot to flex. Here, like and subscribe.